Well, thank you very, very, very much, Roberta, for a gorgeous uh, introduction and welcome. I, uh, not that I compare myself, but I once read that Winston Churchill, after a particularly moving introduction, said he could hardly wait to hear what he had to say. <laughs> so, I always think good introductions should come after, and people think, well, she wasn't that great. I don't know. <laughs> But I do thank you, and I thank all of you for being here tonight, and to the whole wonderful Council of Canadians team, all my, my friends and, and family uh, in this wonderful chapter here in Victoria. Thank you, and to the Canadian Union of Public Employees, and to Island Water Watch and Greater Vancouver uh, Water Watch. Um, it's just absolutely superb to be here. And I do want to say, Kim, I'm really glad we're on the same side. <laughs> I mean, well, you wouldn't want her opposing you, would you? I mean, that energy, I think we don't need any more hydroelectricity on the island. We've got your, <laughs> your wonderful energy. And by the way, Kim, I think it's important to know that not only is the BC government requiring that municipalities look at public-private partnerships, but in the Harper 2007 budget, they also now require any municipality in Canada seeking federal funding for major water infrastructure projects has to show that they have fully considered, that's the term, public-private partnerships in order to get fu uh, public uh, federal funding. So, yes, one more reason to get angry enough when the election comes to do something about this. <laughs> we are nonpartisan and all that, but do something about that man, please. <laughs> Just do something. And in case any of you here still don't know wonderful Carlene Picard, our organizer here in British Columbia, Carlene is right here and been, uh, been my wonderful friend uh, taking care of me while I've, I've been here uh, on this tour. I'm thrilled to be here with this new book. Um, when I wrote Blue Gold, I thought, well, that's it, whatever else could be said, but it's almost six years old. And in fact, everything we predicted in that book has come true and it was time to tell the story. And I'm just going to mostly talk about Canada, but I'm going to start off globally. The, the book will be coming out in an international edition uh, in the United States in um, the new year. And then I've, we've got many, many countries publishing it, which makes me very excited. The Canadian version is the same book, only it has a chapter on Canada, U.S. called It's Canada's Water for Sale. And as you know, the rest of the world isn't interested in Canada, so that part's not in the international book. It's terrible. It's so terrible and true. But here's the story, just very briefly. There are really, I argue, three crises coming together globally around water. And the crises are ecological, human, and what I call democracy, or the corporate crisis. The ecological crisis is this. We have, as a human species, polluted surface water to the extent that in many, many parts of the world it's no longer accessible. So the water people used and accessed for millennia is no longer available. So everywhere, whether it's because pollution has taken its toll or because industry is what demanding more, um, industrial agriculture is demanding more, we are putting bore wells into the ground, into the underground water sources in such huge amounts and numbers that we're pulling up the groundwater far faster than it can be replenished anywhere on earth. The statistics are stunning. Further than that, we are now moving water from one part of the world to or from aquifers and, and watersheds where we can get at the water to places where we can no longer get at it. So for instance, we take it and we water a desert. And as one scientist said to me, if you take water from an aquifer and you water a desert, you create two deserts eventually. It's not like you exchange it and suddenly there's an oasis over here. It may be in there somewhere, but it's not accessible. Or we take it from, and this is a very important point, we take it from freshwater systems, from uh, freshwater uh, ecosystems, we send it to great big metropolises, and then they dump it into the ocean, either treated or untreated, so that fresh water is not returned to the system. Or, and, we pave over wetlands and, and, and meadows and take down forests and so on. And so the hydrologic cycle can't work. Remember we all learned back in grade five, there's a finite hydrologic cycle, the water can't go anywhere. Well, it can. It can't, if it can't return to green, <laughs> not to plastic, but to green grass and stuff, and to trees, it can't transpire. The process of transpiration cannot happen. 
Scientists described it to me as, as if the water drops on an umbrella, cement umbrella, and falls off into the ocean. On, you know, it is not going into the ground. So it's, we're actually losing water from the hydrologic cycle. And finally, we are exporting water out of watersheds in the form of something called virtual water trade. Virtual water trade is where you use your water to grow something that you then export. Um, and many countries are doing this, some because they're st refusing to deal with their water crisis, the United States and um, Australia being two countries in water crisis, so-called first world countries, who are continuing to export massive amounts of their water away. But many of the countries who do it are poor countries. For instance, in uh, January, I was at the World Social Forum in, in Nairobi, and I went to the famous Lake Naivasha, and I went on this lake, and really I can, I can only describe it to you as one of the most incredible mystic and, and, and spiritual experiences of my life to be gliding on this lake, and you see a hippopotamus come up here, and you see a flock of flamingos and a flock of pelicans here, and you look on an island and there are wildebeests and, and giraffes and gazelles, and I said to the boatman, my goodness, it looks just like out of Africa. And he said, well, that would be because that's where out of Africa was filmed, right there, right, <laughs> right there, right? But it's being destroyed. The big flower companies, as in not flower as in grain, but flower as in roses, um, from Europe, particularly British and, and Dutch, have surrounded the lake and they're sucking up the water to grow roses to send to Europe because the Europeans don't want to use their water for this anymore. So they're preserving their own water. And uh, scientists in, in the area have said that uh, Lake Naivasha will be, and I quote, a putrid puddle in uh, five to ten years. It's going to be gone. So I'm looking to find Robert Redford and Meryl Streep. I want to launch a campaign to get the flower companies out of Africa. As you can, don't you think that's a great title? <laughs> So here we have the situation where we are exporting about 20% of all daily domestic water use in the world out of watersheds because we you know, are stupid or we need the money, um, and this is the, the situation. So my argument is on this first, this first crisis that we are creating at the ground level through our abuse, pollution, mismanagement and displacement of water the equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions to climate change. It's not just that the water crisis is a consequence or an effect of, cri of climate change, it is one of the major causes. And that to me is a brand new kind of concept that I am hoping this book is going to help uh, you know, enter the debate because we're hearing climate change or, or the, the, the crisis only in terms of greenhouse gas emissions trapping. And I, I, I show in the book that it's, it's actually both. So that's the first crisis. And as a result, of course, many places on Earth are just literally running out. And this is not cyclical drought, running out of water. And one of those places, I'll come back to this, is the United States, where 36 states are in either serious to severe crisis. And the American Geological Society says that the drought, so-called drought, in the Midwest and Southwest is the worst in 500 years. You've all been reading about Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, where were they? This was predicted for 10 years that Atlanta was going to run out of water. So that's the ecological crisis. The human rights crisis, of course, is that there are many people now without water. About two billion people live in parts of the world that don't have adequate access to water. Um, every day in our world, more children die from dirty water than from HIV, AIDS, malaria, accidents, and war put together. It's the number one killer of children. Half of the hospital beds on Earth are filled with people who are there with totally preventable diseases, but because they can't find clean water, they have take drunk clean water that is not um, safe. Uh, and this is a, an epidemic that's going to grow the, just with population growth, just with and the expansion of an industrial model in countries that have been water self-sufficient. This is taking place phenomenally quickly. There are 23 million bore wells in India alone down pumping that water 24-7. And all of a sudden, some mornings, whole valleys wake up and the water's gone because <clears throat> water goes when water use is taken exponentially, it just suddenly dries up. So you go to bed at night and you think you got lots of water, the next morning it's gone because there have been, you know, the thousand points that it's been taken from. This is the single greatest uh, crisis of our time and there are now conflicts, personal conflicts, wars around water all over the world. 
Then the third crisis around water, the one that exacerbates the first two, is that the corporations of our world, big private sector interests, are moving in to, to create a water cartel, corporate water cartel, and they are deadly serious about it. Now there is, of course, the service companies, the, the, what they were fighting here that Kim was describing, whether it's service, servicing or um, servicing the, the drinking water or the wastewater treatment. The World Bank has forced the developing world to uh, accept and adopt a privatization model. And I have a chapter in here which describes how the World Bank and its friends in, in the corporate world manufactured consent for a private uh, future for water in the global south when a public water system was working very nicely in the global north. And that wasn't as easy to do as you might think because the people in the global south aren't stupid. And they saw people in the global north having public water services and said, why do we have to have private? And it's an incredible and very distressing story. And I also show how it has massively failed. That in fact, the amount of money put into <clears throat> the third world for water services has actually declined in total over the 15 years of privatization because the um, World Bank and the agencies of the like Canadian in, uh, International Development Agency and so on all thought that the private companies were going to put more money in and they didn't. They take money out, they don't put money in, they're not there to provide a service, they're there to make a profit. But there's also an emerging form of corporate control of water and that is the new technology around water cleanup, whether it's massive desalination plants, which are polluting, energy intensive, disgusting, dirty, last, you know, the last thing you do when you're running out of water technology, except nobody's thinking of it as the last thing you do. Net nuclear power desalination, which is the hottest and latest thing, and I show how there's huge pressure growing for that. Nanotechnology, totally and completely deregulated. Uh, um, um, atmospheric water generators, where they're sucking water out of clouds and out of the atmosphere. I mean, we're playing God. Uh, even something called toilet to tap um, uh, <clears throat> technology, where uh, we're working with a group in Australia called CAD, Citizens Against Drinking Sewage. I mean, literally, they're being told that as we export your water, your best left, whatever's left of your water away in this virtual water trade, this is what you're going to be left to drink. And I describe, and, and I'm very deeply concerned that the billions of dollars, you cannot imagine how much money is being put into this by governments, particularly the American government, but the Europeans, the Israelis, the Chinese, and so on, into this technology. My very, very great concern is that um, this is going to be a complete disincentive to protect water sources because there is so much money to be made by these big water companies. And the water companies I'm talking about are now General Electric, Procter & Gamble, um, Dow Chemical. Do you want to trust your drinking water with the people who brought you Bhopal? They're big time into water now. So I have just a, a scenario, I'd read you a couple of paragraphs and I say, imagine a world in 20 years in which no substantive progress has been made to provide basic water services in the third world or to create laws to protect source water and force industry and industrial agriculture to stop polluting water systems, or to curb the mass movement of water by pipeline, tanker, and other diversions, which will have created huge new swaths of desert. And this is what it will look like. Desalination plants will ring the world's oceans, many of them run by nuclear power. Corporate-controlled nanotechnology will clean up sewage water and sell it to private utilities, which will in turn sell it back to us at a huge profit. The rich will drink only bottled water found in the few remaining uncontaminated parts of the world or sucked from the clouds by corporate controlled machines while the poor die in increasing numbers from a lack of water. This is not science fiction. This is where the world is headed unless we change course, a moral and ecological imperative. And then I tell the story about the wonderful fight back that's happening, which I'll save a story or two for the end. So that, I wanted to put that out to you as the big picture of what we're dealing with when we come to Canada and talk to you about what's happening here. There are basically three myths that I deal with in the book around water in Canada. One is that we have 20% of the world's water. You'll read that as recently as today in the National Post, Diane Francis once again says we have 20% of the world's water and should be selling it. This is not true. The only way that would be true is if we drained every river and every lake in the country. We have about 6.5% of the available fresh water. That's the water you can use and not draw down on your capital. We actually... <coughs> 
We actually, thank you. We actually have no idea where our water, our groundwater is. Uh, we, the um, Natural Resources Canada says it would take 30 years to do a proper inventory and we haven't even started. Our 1,300 glaciers are melting. Uh, we've lost between 25 and 70 percent of their mass all, all, already and all are slated to disappear. The Great Lakes are declining. We're taking four trillion liters of water a day out of the Great Lakes Basin, and nature is not putting four trillion liters of water back, I can tell you. Some communities on Lake Michigan are putting bore wells down into the, the, the water systems that feed the Great Lakes as deep as Chicago skyscrapers go high in the sky. That's how deep into the ground they're going. They're sucking out so much water that they're now taking in Lake Michigan water. They're not pulling out groundwater, they're pulling down Lake Michigan water, uh, reversing the flow of water for the first time in history. Canada is a net exporter of bottled water and most provinces charge nothing for this. The companies just get to come in and extract this money and get rich. The tar sands are destroying water that takes between three and five units of water for every unit of oil we extract from the tar sands. Most of this is lost to the hydrologic cycle because it's so polluted. Uh, and um, we're, you know, where our water systems from Lake Winnipeg to many of the water systems around here are in serious decline. So that's the first thing I want to say around our myths that we have this wonderful surplus. Not true. Secondly, we have a myth that we love our water heritage. Not true again. I would say if we loved our water heritage, we would, be, we would all be like Kim. We would be so passionate, we would be fighting to protect it. But 42% of the water discharged by Canada's manufacturing business is dumped untreated into our sewers and, and rivers and so on. Our cities dump another 200 billion liters of raw sewage a year, a volume that would cover the entire 7,800 kilometer length of the Trans-Canada Highway, six stories high. We've destroyed wetlands. We allow chemical toxins from industrial food production to run off into our waters. There are more than 360 chemical compounds found now in the Great Lakes. And untreated sewage and phosphorus, hog farm effluent have made Lake Winnipeg the sickest body of water in Canada. And most of that tar sands water I was talking about is dumped into these huge, huge lagoons. Now they now cover 50 square kilometers and threaten Canada's largest watershed, the Mackenzie River uh, Basin. And of course, First Nations right across the country are in crisis around the um, lack of clean drinking water. At this point, it, there's about at least 86 um, First Nations reserves that are, are uh, under uh, boil water advisory. The third myth is that Canada, the Canadian government protects our water. This is not so. We have no national water policy. We're one of the few industrialized countries not to have legally enforced water quality standards. We have no national standards for sewage dumping or for uh, toxic dumping. In fact, successive governments have gutted environmental water ecosystems. And a leaked Environment Canada memo says that there is a water crisis looming in Canada, but there is no one in charge and no one at the top is listening. Nor do we have a ban on the commercial export of water. This is very important for you to know. Interestingly, we came the closest when Brian Mulroney was Prime Minister and a wonderful man named Ralph Pentland, who was head of the Water Directorate at Environment Canada, prepared policy that, uh, to ban the export of commercial, uh, commercial export of water, got all the way to being a law that was tabled in the House of Commons, and then the 1988 election happened, which was a free trade election, and the first thing the government did after it was re-elected was to sign the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which says that water is a tradable good. Well, you couldn't ban a tradable good. Uh, it's very, very clear in the language of uh, both that Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA that followed it that you cannot place an export restriction. So the legislation quietly dropped and uh, nothing has happened since. Although in the late 1990s there was a flood of interest, Newfoundland came very close to exporting lake, a water lake from a, a, a lake called Lake Gisborne. Uh, a big company in uh, Mike Harris's Ontario was given the go-ahead to ship water from Lake Superior. It's only when the Americans screamed that they couldn't do it that they backed off. So there was a lot of pressure placed on the Chrétien government and, he, and what they did was they asked the provinces to adopt a voluntary ban. 
uh, which has kind of been in place. It's weak, it's voluntary, any province could break it at any time. And so we are left with this hodgepodge, this mishmash. And then recently, we have uh, been very worried about our water under the Security and Prosperity Partnership for North America. Now, the Security and Prosperity Partnership is this agreement or this handshake that took place in Waco, Texas in March 2005 that agrees to create a security and prosperity um, fortress in North America, as the premier of this province calls it, ziplocking North America into a security perimeter designed in Washington in order to make sure that the, the uh, exchange of, of goods is uninterrupted, although of course it hasn't been in any case. Um, and what happened in this past, there were many signs that they were talking about water under the Security and Prosperity Partnerships Resource Pact. But it wasn't until this past spring that I received in the mail, in a brown paper bag, uh, information about a group called the Center for International Strategic Studies in the U.S. Now this is a, a, base, a huge think tank that works very closely with the U.S. government and it had formed something called Global Water Futures to advise the American government on water as a national security issue and they're working with and paid for by Coca-Cola, ITT Industries which is a giant water technology company, Procter & Gamble which now makes home purifiers and then the Sandia National Laboratories. And Sandia National Laboratories uh, works with the Pentagon, and I quote, to maintain US military and nuclear superiority. And currently, Sandia Laboratories is contracted out to Lockheed Martin to run, and Lockheed Martin is the world's biggest weapons manufacturer. Now put this together. <coughs> The United States is running out of clean water. It has suddenly started to realize that water is a national security issue of the utmost importance. It's hired this think tank and this Sandia Laboratories run by a weapons manufacturer to advise them on water as a national security issue. You start to see how the military concept and the military construct is going to start to surround uh, this need for water. Well, it turns out that this Center for International Strategic Studies was also hired to do the security environmental blueprint for the Security and Prosperity Partnership for North America called North America Futures 2025. And the document that I got hold of was a planned meeting in Calgary this past May, closed door, where they were openly talking about security and water together, and that Canada had 20% of the world's water, false, but that's what it said, and the United States was in trouble, and that Canada's water would, under this process, start to become U.S. water. And when the head of this project was... When we put this out to the public, the one, a sharp reporter called the head of this project uh, and he said, it's no secret that the U.S. is going to need water. At the end of the day, there may have to be arrangements and that's the term that they use. Now, we made this public uh, and temporarily, I think they've backed off and the Canadian government has said, don't be silly, we'd never do any such thing. But I am, I remember, I got a long memory. I was fighting this thing back 20 years ago when we were first told that we were going to have an agreement that included Canada's energy. And I was told then that I was just being paranoid that I thought that there might be some, some connection through NAFTA and the loss of our energy. Or, or this was a, um, you know, a conspiracy theory, I was told by Mulroney, Maud Barlow and her conspiracy theories. Well, when I hear about conspiracy theories, I think about the two cows on the hill and one's always reading pamphlets. And the other says to her one day, we're always reading pamphlets. Will you stop, you and your conspiracy theories? But this time, the other cow's reading a, a pamphlet that says where beef really comes from. <laughs> <laughs> the United States is interested in Canada's water. There are a lot of people in this country which, who would sell Canada's water out, and there are corporations chomping at the bit. And for anybody who says it's too expensive to send that water south, that's what they said about the tar sands as recently as five years ago. It would never be uh, economically feasible to, to, to zap that 
you know, through that heavy steam process to zap that uh, heavy oil out of the tar sands. When the U.S. needs it, the U.S. wants it, it will pay what it has to pay. And we need to be, uh, we, I, I can taste this process. This is happening in little bits and pieces of drops of hints there. And then they retreat and then they come back. I remember it very well and the population kind of gets softened up. And aren't we mean and aren't we being selfish with our energy and aren't we being selfish with our water? Why shouldn't we share it with Las Vegas so they can have, do you know they just built uh, a new 7,000 bedroom hotel and complex based on, on Venice in, in, uh, in Las Vegas that has the canals, you get to the gambling area by boat, everything is, is canals and fountains, it's an entire water theme, uh, an absolutely huge area in the middle of the desert that has absolutely no water. Now, I, we say Canada is in urgent need of a national water policy and a strategy to protect our water ecologically on one hand, but also jurisdictionally on the other. To be effective, this has to be developed with all levels of government, and that includes, of course, federal, provincial, municipal, First Nations, and we want um, civil society as well um, in there. And it, we need to set out principles around water being a public trust, a human right, a public service, a sovereign uh, responsibility to protect, and it's extraordinarily important that we do this as our piece. We're calling, and I call in the book, for something I call a blue covenant for water here in Canada and around the world, and that is that we have a covenant ecologically, a covenant with the earth for conservation, and there are, we know the, what we have to do to protect the world's water. We just simply don't have the political leadership yet, but we know what we need to do. We have to have a covenant to justice, a covenant to equity, a solidarity pact between the global north and the global south on water justice. Water for all has to be absolutely the, 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 the rallying cry there. And then we need a, a, a covenant or a piece of the covenant needs to address democracy. And, and, the, and the reality that water is not a commercial good, it is not for sale to the highest bidder, no one should be allowed to appropriate it for, for profit while other people die because they cannot afford the, to, to access it. Um, and it must be seen as a public trust and a fundamental human right. And we want that notion at every level of government. I was in a little town in New Hampshire a couple of weeks ago called Barnstead, and it's one of those you go through and if you blink, it's gone, right? Nestle's all over these, com these rural communities in this area for Poland Springs. And you sit there on the highway and you watch these gigantic Poland Springs trucks going down one after the other down the highway, taking away the local water sources. The local people in Barnstead couldn't get their government to do anything about it, so they got together, 136 of them, and they unanimously voted for an ordinance that they did not want their water taken away, that it's a public trust, that it belongs to them, it belongs to nature, and it's natural environment, and they, they said, uh, the company's not welcome there, and for whatever reason, because frankly it's not particularly legal, the company has been loath to go into that uh, community, and Barnstead has become this little oasis of public water protection uh, in this area where the water is being taken out. So we wanted at that level, to the national level where constitutions declare water to be a human right, like Uruguay, which three years ago became the first country in the world to vote in a national election that water was a human right. It was a fierce fight. Uh, I went down there twice to talk to the media, to hold public events and so on, and that was a real act of solidarity from many of us in the global north. And Uruguay passed this resolution, they changed the constitution, they kicked the corporations out, right up to the United Nations, where we are working now for our, the right to water. And I have to tell you a lovely story about Uruguay. That model, that country has set a model for all of Latin America, and the people who did this work, and they, had, they worked for three years to get the plebiscite, to, and they were working from one old computer held together by duct tape. I was so touched by what they were able to do and the cheerfulness and the joy and the excitement of doing this work was so moving. Uh, and they have now, they're now traveling around teaching other groups in, in Latin America how to do this, how to 
fight for this in their own countries. And our, our latest huge f uh, victory was that last spring in El Salvador, there was a big march of people protesting, a peaceful march protesting privatized water. The army was brought in, some people were killed. It was a terrible thuggish attack on these people. They were, uh, many of them were arrested under the anti-terrorism legislation and held as terrorists. Uh, there has been such an outcry from our movement around the world and also from within El Salvador and thousands, tens and tens of thousands marched last week in El Salvador. The government has released the people and has promised to bring in a le uh, legislation similar to the Uruguay legislation. It's a phenomenal victory. <laughs> I'd rather talk with you than at you anymore, so I'm just going to end with a couple of thoughts. One is that, you know, water is a really interesting thing to work with because it can lead, it can open doors. The, in in um, in this other town, in in uh, this is Freiburg in Maine, just near this this place that I was telling you about, where ne where uh, Poland Springs is taking the water. The fight's being led by an 87-year-old Republican businessman. <laughs> you know, he never been on our side before, but he's on a watershed and it's being destroyed because Nestle is, is just pulling out the water from the watershed and his lake is dying. And then he said to me, did you know that the, there's World Trade Organization, damn it, protects these companies? And I said, mm, I'd heard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did you know that the World Bank is, you know, forcing these, you know, did you know, and, and do, you, do you know that our companies are telling our government, these corporations telling our governments what to do and they're listening? And I said, I'd heard, I'd heard something to that effect. You know? <laughs> but it's just wonderful to watch this movement grow as people learn and as people, you know, it, it's just a wonderful, issue to work on it, it 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 and it's such a fabulous movement that we're building and I tell that story in this book too I call it the water warriors fight back but I see really two futures for water one of them is that water is going to lead to more conflict and half of one of the chapters in here just tells about everything from personal farmers in this valley in Indonesia who get up every morning really early to try to get out there's so just a little bit of water in, the, in this well and they will bring pitchforks and, and knives to kill each other at, because the first one there gets some water, the first few there and after that nobody gets there and so they're physically fighting each other right up until whole communities, city versus country. I mean, Mexico City's run out of water, so it sends pipelines hundreds of kilometers away into First Nations communities, into indigenous farmer, rural, peasant areas. The Mazawas are a local tribe there. They've just gone in, absconded with the water, put a great big fortress with armed guards around it, and that's it. Sorry, we took your water. Um, this is going to be more and more the scenario in the future unless, and here's the, the possible alternative, water becomes nature's gift to humanity to teach us how to live in peace with one another and in harmony with the earth. And I think of the wonderful people in Friends of the Earth Middle East who are made up from all the different warring factions who've said, let's just talk about water. Let's just sit down, let's not talk about the history and how this all started and religion, let's not do that, or boundaries or borders. Let's just talk about water. And they're having these amazing meetings where they pull people in the communities there together just to say, let's not try to agree on everything. Let's just try to protect our water and see if the protection of our joint water upon which we all depend could possibly lead um, to some kind of peace. So I just end with two, um, two quotes from the, that I start the book off with. One is The Four Laws of Ecology by Ernest Kallenbeck, a wonderful American environmentalist. This is kind of the Bible of the, of the environmental movement. The four laws of ecology are these. All things are interconnected. Everything goes somewhere. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And nature bats last, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> And then finally, my, the lovely words that I have loved for many years from J.R. Tol Tolkien. Um, it's Gandalf speaking as he's facing a particularly terrible night. I loved this before the film, although I did love the movies. But he says this, the rule of no realm is mine, but all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail of my task, if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair 
or bear fruit and flower again in the days to come. For I too am a steward. Did you not know? Thank you very much. The, the getting into the end pipe, <laughs> as it were, is a very, very common strategy because, quite frankly, people don't care about it as much. There's like, who cares who takes care of the wastewater, but I want to be sure my water that I drink is clean. And so that they know that. They did that in Hamilton, and the story in Hamilton is just an incredible one. It was a terrible failure. Um, they've done that in many cities in the United States. They tend to do that more in the, nor in the global north. Uh, because what happened in the Global South is that the World Bank has forced countries to take these companies for both the drinking water delivery and the, and, the, and the wastewater. Actually, in the Global South, they don't usually fulfill their wastewater promises. Uh, but in the Global North, they've, they've started at the other end of the pipe. And as, as uh, Kim said earlier, that's where they start, and it's piece by piece. While I've got you know this notion here, I do want to add something to you, to folks in British Columbia. This privatization is one really dangerous um, first step towards uh, private, the corporate privatization of water here. But so is this uh, process where um, hydroelectric, private hydroelectric companies, the Run of the River project, where they're getting the right to uh, ha use public water to make money. Uh, for themselves on hydroelectricity and, and potentially the right to claim to own that water or the right to sell that water. And I, this is how it happens. It doesn't start with, the, you don't get the right to vote should we have private or public water systems. If we had that, we would vote over, overwhelmingly against it and that would be the end of it. What happens is that they sneak in through the back door, kind of like what's happening in healthcare, and nobody votes against. Uh, public health care, but one day you wake up and it's been chipped away. It's a death of a thousand cuts. And there are some real concerns here in British Columbia about privatization and, and companies like EPCOR and, and others that are, are, are just sitting there waiting because, you know, this the water issue is going to hit here like it's hit everywhere. It's going to hit on this island, this beautiful island of yours. So we must be prepared with a fight and a, and a set of principles that guide us. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, there are better people or people better situated to talk about the Accenture. I mean, I know a bit about it, and I know it was awful here in, in uh, British Columbia. And I know that your media, like the media, or our media here, because I consider myself to be a pan-Canadian, our media here is pretty well the same as our media everywhere, con concentrated in the hands of of concentrated corporate power, and they are not going to tell the story. I mean, you look at the Globe and Mail, you want to talk about the Security and Prosperity Partnership? Security and Prosperity Partnership is, uh, is guided by something called the North American Competitiveness Council, which is the 30 biggest corporations in North America that were officially set up at the second Security and Prosperity Partnership meeting in Cancun, Mexico. One of the Canadian companies to that is Bell Globe Media, which owns the Globe and Mail. So do you think we can get one word in the Globe and Mail about the Security and Prosperity Partnership? So it is a problem that we have. On the other hand, I want to say, because I'm not going to ever leave you without hope, or and I'm truly not without hope, we are getting the word out on the SPP. When I wrote my book, two, it came out two, two and a half years ago now, nobody was talking about it. And now we, it's, it's becoming something people understand. Uh, a colleague went into a, 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 a restaurant when we had our big demonstration in Ottawa the day before the Montebello summit, and somebody asked a police officer, what the protesters were all about. And he said, well, the Prime Minister of Canada's meeting with the Pri President of Mexico and the United States, they're talking about the future of North America. But they're only talking to big corporations, and these people don't think that's fair. And I thought, well, we did our job. <laughs> you know, we did it. And, and, and the papers had to, when we got the numbers of people out, it actually worked. And of course, then we took photos at the Montebello summit of police provocateurs 
pretending to be protesters. We even got photos of their boots, which shows clearly that when they were so-called arrested, they were not arrested at all, that this was just a shocking, it was just shocking. It was police <coughs> pretending to be protesters. And as I said, they're back in the van now having their milk and cookies, right? It was just a, a and it's a very funny story because Dave Coles from uh, Communication Energy and Paper Workers pulled down the mask of one of them and, and the police said, uh, they're not police, and they denied it officially at first, but, and the Quebec pa papers put this man's picture in the papers, and his mother called and said, that's my boy, I'm so proud of him, he's a police officer. So, I, I love mothers, I'm a mother myself. And so they, so the police had to hold a second press conference and say, whoops, we're really embarrassed, I guess they were our guys after all. So. You know, we have to find clever ways around this, but there, uh, and here's why water is such a good issue, because people get this issue. They get it, they get it. That it's not like running shoes or Coca-Cola, that water is, well, what Coca-Cola is water, and abusing, Coke abuses water to get it to us, but it is not a commodity, and, and you can have all the Globe and Mails and the National Posts and the Vancouver Suns and so on in the world telling you that you just be, sen be sensible and let's commodify it. People's hearts know different, hearts and minds know differently, and I think this can be a fabulous issue for us and one that we can win. I really do. Right. Well, you have to know that I fought Senator Carney tooth and nail back in the old free trade days, right? She was one of the major architects, and it's lovely to agree with her. I agree with her, and I'm delighted to agree with her. It's wonderful to see that this change has happened. The other person who's speaking out on water is Peter Lockheed. You know, so like wonder of wonders. I mean, I, Bob White and I, just to take you a little, little story, just a little anecdote, and I'll come back to your question. Uh, back in 98, 1988, on the eve of the election, Barbara um, uh, Frum, the late Barbara Frum, was a wonderful person, held, was the host of a two-night debate on free trade with myself and Bob White on one side and Peter Lockheed and Tom DeKino on the other. And they kept us separated. It was everybody famous you ever met in this. It was the old city hall where Confederation was debated. And they started off say, by saying, another historic debate takes place here tonight. And I said to Bob White, I am so nervous. I'm going to vomit right here. I'm going to stand up in front of the entire Canadian nation and vomit. And he said, don't do that, Ma. Think of something else, you know. I, and I remember saying to him, actually, I called Mel Hertig. And I said, look, I'm really nervous. Can you give me some advice? And I said, but I'm so nervous, you have to keep it really simple because I'm really nervous, right? He said, okay, simple. These are bad men, they want to hurt your country. And I said, <laughs> I said, I think I got it, it's internalized, right? So they put me and Bob in one room where we're being nervous and they put these two cocky guys in another room where they just going to breeze in and clean up the floor with us, right? So we all come out to meet just because we're about to go into this room live with all these famous writers and scientists and everybody in this room. So I had met Dequino before, I debated him, but I'd never met Peter Lougheed. He was then pres uh, Premier of Alberta and he came up to me and he said, Maud, I'm Peter Lougheed, how are you? And I meant to say, I'm fine. I said, I'm nice. <laughs> I guess I had, you're bad, I'm not, in my mind, right? I thought, now it is over. I will now for sure vomit on television in front of, in front of my mother, my kids, my husband, everybody. In fact, it was really great. It was a, we watched it the other day, and it's, it's, it was really interesting, because Tom DeKino the first night did so badly that he started to sweat, and the, drip was, the sweat was just dripping off his nose. <laughs> So then the next day, the makeup lady said to me, well, I have to tell you a secret. She said, I've poured um, underarm deodorant. I sprayed it on his forehead for tonight. We'll see how it works. And I never told that story for years until he got real mean about me. And now I put it in my book. Oh, I'll tell the world about Tom Bikino doing that, right? Uh, all right, back to Pat Carney and your question, because of course Pat Carney and Peter Lougheed and these guys were all so gung-ho free trade and water's not in there, they would say. Well, water was most certainly in there. 
it's in NAFTA as well, you don't see the word water. You have to go to the, when they say good, and you have to go to the definition of good that was negotiated in the old GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And there it is, water in all its forms, including ice and snow. We would pull this out, we'd show it to them. Barry Appleton wrote about it in his excellent book, Navigating NAFTA, but he still said we were lying. And then they said we were lying over in NAFTA. So it's really wonderful now to see some of those folks um, admitting that it's a problem. The amendment that you're talking about, and I do write about it in my book, to the Boundary Water Treaties Act was the second part of what the Kretsche Martin government tried to do. See, they had promised in their 93 Red Book that they would ban the export of commercial water. When they got into power, they realized they couldn't do that because they would be banning a good. You're not allowed to ban the export of a good under NAFTA. So what they did was they tried to find an environmental way to get around it, and that was both the uh, ban on the by the provinces, which is voluntary, and then this ban on cross border uh, or, or cross boundary waters. But it, it first of all, they said it was amendment to the act. But if the Americans don't agree to it, it's not an amendment at all, right? So it was never a true amendment, and it didn't touch all the waters that aren't cross boundary. I mean, it is full of holes. It is absolutely full of holes. So yes, um, I, you know, I know about the Carney, uh, Pat Carney. Um, uh, what would you call it, a private, uh, private. private member's bill, and that with the excellent uh, private member's bill of the NDP are two processes that are pushing on this uh, project, and you know, we just keep working all together, but yes, I, I know about it, I'm pleased with it, and, and write about it. Well, thank you so much. Um, there are so many, and, and I have a whole half a chapter devoted to them. It's nice to see you, Saul. Um, people don't know, for instance, the Darfur. At the heart of the Darfur uh, conflict is water. And that had the government uh, decided to address the conflict between the nomads and the farmers um, around the dwindling water supplies, that there might have been um, an option. Of course, they chose not to take that option for their own reasons. But, and of course, many people know that at the heart of many of the Middle East struggles um, is are, are, are fights about water. Um, there is a growing conflict around the Guarani Aquifer, which is a huge aquifer surrounded by five uh, Latin American countries because the Americans have put uh, military bases all around it. And they say that there are terrorists there. What's actually there is water, lots and lots and lots and lots of water. Um, and there are, are concerns growing there. The, um, the Mazawas, the, I was telling you about earlier, the Mexican, the, first, uh, the, 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 the indigenous communities and tribal, tribal peoples are cutting the, the pipes, They're beginning to do what the Ogoni people have done to the oil pipes in, in, uh, in Nigeria, are actually cutting it, saying, you're, you're not taking our water, we're going to cut into it. And you're going to find more and more of that kind of subversion, I think. Um, just every, just so many conflicts that I, 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 if I sort of could pull out the book and list them, but um, really, a, a, even down to individual conflicts in Sydney, uh, Australia, neighbors phoning a, a squeal, squeal line and, and telling a, a, on other neighbors who are watering their lawns at night or taking water when they shouldn't be. I mean, it even comes down sometimes to this very personal conflict. But this, uh, there are refugees. I have uh, estimates in here from the World Watch Institute about how many refugees there are. And I want to say, Saul, that the heart of what I'm trying to say around the ecological crisis is not just that water is the face of climate change, because it is, but that water is also the cause. And that if we don't deal with declining water, the poisoning, polluting, mismanagement, displacement, abuse of water, we're not going to be able to just deal with it with, with the climate change question around greenhouse gas emissions and peace. And I give you, I, I use the term these days, um, global warming made me do it. Because I think there are politicians who are using global warming as an excuse not to do anything else. And the best ex example I can give you is Australia. I was there last fall. I spoke at a conference, a huge conference. Oh, it was so interesting. It was called the Na International Land Care Conference. It was about caring for land. And they had, they were, everybody had, uh, was drinking only Coca-Cola water in bottles. Now, there were 1,500 delegates there for three days in this convention center. And they had a hall 
that was maybe four times as big as this filled with Coca-Cola plastic water bottles. And I was told that they had no choice, that for safety reasons or whatever, that that's what the, con that's what the convention center uh, you know, requires, whatever. But I mean, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of these bottles, right? So I got up at the very beginning of it and I said, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Here we are, land care conference in a, in a continent running out of water where Coca-Cola's in here taking your water and selling it back to you and bottling and shipping it out of the country. What's wrong with this picture? And the people were just tremendously supportive. And in fact, I, I was just, I mean, the, the situation is so shocking. While I was there, there was a, a story in the newspaper that in Victoria, the state that I was in, 80% of the crops were going to fail that year because of the water crisis. Now, would, and then there are other stories, you know, that Sydney has, you know, five years left and, and, and uh, you know, well, just uh, horrific stories. And I was on television, and this one reporter said to me, Ms. Barlow, Dr. Riggle, Dr. Barlow, why, what makes you say that we have a water crisis? And I said, well, as my three-year-old granddaughter would say, hello, you know, <laughs> hello. <laughs> but here's what the government, the Howard government says, well now, it's just global warming. It's climate change, and it's not ours. We haven't done anything, it blew here. And so there's nothing we can do. And in fact, they're continuing on with every horrible practice. Here's what they're doing with their water. They are draining their wetlands. They have left 80,000 barrels of polluted toxic dumps, uh, uh, barrels dumped under the, in the waterways under their major cities. They have passed a new law that allows farmers in the rural community to sell their water allocations to the city or, co or corporation. So they are delinking the water from the river systems, simply the worst thing you can do. They are allowing massive amounts of bottled water. They're talking about shipping water in from Tasmania on a for-profit basis. They're building desalination plants, which are polluting, dirty, uh, send out a dirty chemical brine that kills all the aquatic life there. And they are continuing to export the best water, what's left of their best water in this big agribusiness, virtual water trade, to China. And they're about to sign a free trade agreement with China because China has destroyed its water so that you could buy all your running shoes and shower curtain liners from China. China's water, you could not exaggerate the crisis in China. 80% of the surface water polluted beyond use. 90% of the groundwater under the major cities in China is polluted. Four-fifths of the people in China are drinking polluted water every day. The government just announced the death, the official death, of the third largest lake in China, one that they chose about 10 years ago to allow to die because they allowed the chemical companies to build around it and dump their toxins untreated. It provided a livelihood for 2.3 million people, mostly rice farmers. This is what, you know, this is so that they can grow and grow and grow. So Australia, seeing this, says, let's send our grain and use our water to grow cotton and beef. Beef's a big thing, selling to China. And so this is the water being taken out of what's left of the water being taken out of Australia's ground and sent with, by this big agribusiness. So I, so I used the term when I was there that global warming made me do it or climate change made me do it, that the Prime Minister was using it as an excuse. And I really want, I mean, I'm a deep believer in the fact that greenhouse gas emissions are doing everything that, um, you know, Elizabeth May and others say it is, and David Suzuki, I'm not questioning that at any level, please don't get me wrong. But I don't, it, it can't be used as an excuse then to say there are no other environmental crises or that we don't come at them together. And if you do separate them, here's what you get. You get this, well, let's even get some environmentalists saying agricultural biofuels are good because they're going to cut down on fossil fuel use for cars, you know, food to, when you food to feed cars, right? Whereas the truth of the real and the reality is that if you're looking at the water issue, biofuels are uh, appallingly water uh, wasting. I mean, there just isn't the water to deal with the, 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 the planned biofuels in, well, in, in North America and around the world. We just simply don't have the water for what they're planning to do. So if you separate out climate change issues from water issues, you end up with the wrong solution. So that's what I'm trying to get at, is that we take a more holistic approach. And I think, Saul, that you'll find when you're looking at your peace issues that water is absolutely at the core 
of many of the issues that we're dealing with that maybe hasn't been named publicly, but is right there uh, at the core of these, of these uh, fights. I couldn't agree with you more. I think the day will come when we will be holding war crimes for these corporations and perhaps for some of the governments that have so appallingly allowed them to do the kind of damage they do. I do believe that. I also want the day to come, and we're working with Mining Watch Canada and some several other groups, to get a rule so that corporate Canadian companies incorporated in Canada like the mining companies and our mining companies are among the worst in the world in terms of their pollution and their human rights abuse that they cannot behave in other countries in a different way than they behave here they have to act in other work countries as if they were operating here and you know when John Ralston Saul says a lovely thing, and I'll end, I'll end with this because we, we still want to hear from the grannies and have a chance to chat. But John Ralston Saul says that economic, market-based economic globalization is dead. And I agree with him. He says the only people... Yes. Well, it's not that easy. <laughs> yes, it's not that easy. You have to convince the UN. So, but yes, we'll... Yeah. Yeah, but John, uh, just to, John Ralston Saul says that the world is what he calls transiting eras, which I think is a, a, a lovely concept. And the only people left who don't know that economic globalization is dead are the senior politicians around the world, the presidents and prime ministers. I believe they're the first genetically engineered humans among us, actually. <laughs> They all say the same thing. Trains left the station, can't, you know, nothing to do. The bikes, the bicycle's moving, you either fall off or you keep going. And my friend Vandana Shiva says, no, you just put your foot down and you stop the bike, right? You just stop the bike. <laughs> this is a very exciting time to be alive. It's a very, very exciting time to be an activist, to be part of what we're trying to do. It's not easy. I would love to make the war crimes Commission in The Hague deal with this. Right now they're dealing with issues like um, the murder of former Prime Minister of Lebanon, um, Hariri. I mean, there are very serious issues, but one day I would, it would be wonderful if we could expand the concept. And I think we need to understand that as we mature as humans, as a species, we will start to have a, a more a precise definition of what human rights abuses are, and they're not always assassination sometimes. Um, their you know, behavior, deliberate behavior that caused death. And I stood in a, in a community in a place called El Alto, Bolivia, which is the hills overlooking La Paz in the capital of Bolivia. And I stood there where a co the Suez, the company that built the Suez Canal, instead of fulfilling its promise to bring in wastewater treatment, they built these long canals just tunnels really, and they were dumping the raw sewage and the raw garbage and it was sending it through p poor neighborhoods and dumping it in Lake Titicaca. And in fact, I stood downstream from a, an abattoir where the animal parts were coming out and the dogs were all jumping in to grab the stuff and a little boy had died the week before because he'd fallen in this awful, horrible, it was hell. It was your, it was your version of, you know, the worst paintings of Heronius Bosch, you know, it was the worst you could imagine. And I had a film crew from Great Britain and they were filming and I said, you know, up until now I've accused Suez of theft of people's water. Right now I have to say, I'm accusing them of murder, you know? And this, the camera guy, what the, the producer said just a minute, he said, would you like to rephrase that? And I said, not unless you can find a, a stronger word. That's the one I'm going with, you know? So we have to understand that it doesn't always, it's not always at the point of a gun that this kind of crime happens. And when every eight seconds a child somewhere dies in our world from waterborne diseases and it's totally preventable, then we have a cause to rally around. And it means everything from your taking care of your local water source, your own behavior, your own values, up to caring about what happens around the world. And you will do it, and I will do it, and we will do it together. Thank you.